There is an artificial line between STEM and the arts. It's not my phrase. I stole it from Dr. Jackson Hayes at Rhodes College. But there is an artificial line between science, technology, engineering, and mathematics and the fine, performing, and liberal arts. As an engineer and an educator, uh, I thought it would seem weird that I was here giving a presentation on Artful, and so I decided to tell you a story about the last time I was on a stage like this one. I was on a cruise. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. I was on a cruise. <laughs> and on the cruise, there was a gentleman who was doing show tunes. And if you've ever been on a cruise, you know the kind of show that I'm talking about. He's an African-American gentleman, and he was on stage doing tunes from the 20s, 30s, 40s, kind of going through the spectrum of decades. I love these kinds of shows, and so I was positioned right here in the front. Myself, thank you very much, my mom, and my wife. And we were enjoying the show, singing along when we could, but just really having a good time. The audience was not unlike this audience. And so when he got to the 60s, he goes into Motown. And I love Motown. <laughs> I believe that means some of you like Motown too. All right, so he starts in on the song that we all know so very well, My Girl by The Temptations. Oh, I love My Girl. I know Motown. I've seen every movie. I've heard every song. I know the Funk Brothers. I know everything about Motown. He starts in the My Girl and I am just elated. And the crowd is too. Well, I guess you say what can make me feel this way, my girl. <laughs> talking about my girl. Hey, that's what I'm talking about. Right. Now, you know, you're not, you're not clapping for me that time. You're clapping for you. You sounded great, by the way. So exactly. So that's what was happening. You were the crowd. You were in the crowd when the gentleman was on stage. And, and everybody was enjoying it so much that he comes off the stage with the mic. And he's walking up and down the aisle. And he's holding the mic to different individuals, men, so they could sing to their, to their spouses, to their significant others. And they're going through the chorus again and again. And people are going, my girl, my girl. Some of them are doing it well, some of them are doing it poor, but whatever it was, it was great. I mean, the crowd is having a wonderful time. Now, I failed to mention that during the show that the gentleman is playfully flirting with my mother directly in front of him. And <laughs> she is enjoying this like no other. So he comes out and he sings to her, which is a wonderful, wonderful blessing for her, and she was having a great time. And then instead of holding the mic to my face so I could sing to my wife, he handed me the microphone. That was a bad idea. <laughs> so he's here, I take the mic, and I go to the aisle, and he's looking at me, where is he going? I go to the aisle, and I start saying the things that you might hear at a concert, you know, put your arm around the woman that you love. <laughs> Tell her that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really going for it, I'm really enjoying myself. Right? <laughs> and then I come on the stage, and I launch into the second verse. And I know the second verse of the song. I'm gonna, do anybody else know the second verse? Very few, very few people know the second, and I'll tell you why I know in a minute, but very few people know the second verse. So I come on the stage, the band's in the orchestra pit, I wave the band into the second verse, and I start in on the second verse, right? <laughs> I've got so much honey, the bees envy me. Right, now you know, you can hear it when I started, right? So I do that, I sing the second verse, chorus, sing the third verse, wave the crowd into the, the bridge, end the song, take a bow, he's standing on the side of the stage looking at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> That was one of the most significant things that happened in my life. And when I tell that story, when I tell that story, given my educational background and the things that I've accomplished, people who don't know me at all, they chuckle lightly, when I, like when I started in the beginning and I said I was on a cruise. Because everybody knows you do something a little different on a cruise than you do in real life. <laughs> but when I tell it to people who know my position or they understand some of the things that I've done, they look at me like I've literally got two heads. Because they say, how can someone who loves science, engineering, and technology also be such a big fan of music? How can you be so into the arts? And to me, they're the same thing. They've always been the same to me. They've always been the same. When I was working on my dissertation, which was reducing the vibrations of tall buildings due to earthquakes, 
I would imagine the buildings as men or women that were dancing out of control to seismic music. <laughs> and then from that analogy, how do I prevent that? How can we turn down the music? How do we isolate the music so that the dancer doesn't have to dance as much? Or can I change the rhythm of the music so that the dancer can't hear it and won't dance the same way? It really helped me get through graduate school and helped me understand concepts that I'm not sure I would have understood otherwise. And it goes both ways. The reason why I remember the second verse of that song is because to me it is in fact a research problem. How much honey does one need to have? <laughs> in order for a bee to act envious. <laughs> I mean, this is, and, and I'm telling you this because to me, it's all the same. It's, it's one mind, it's not a left brain or a right brain, and, and that theory has been debunked anyway, but it's the whole brain, it's the whole mind. And when you can have those things bleeding from one side to the other, you've got something. Uh, there is an artificial line between STEM and the arts, but it's not old, it's new. Our ancestors knew better. My greatest inspiration is Imhotep, the great African physician and builder, and responsible for building the pyramids at Saqqara and is known as possibly the first physician on record. Also, he was a poet and a sculptor. Many of you may be familiar with the gentleman who did the, the Mona Lisa in The Last Supper, and at the same time, there's some, some, some things that he, some models that he created that show that he had advanced knowledge and thought about aerodynamics, and some of those things look like early helicopters and early airplanes. It was not uncommon in past times for those who were great of thought to have both, to have what we would call the left and have what we call the right. And if you look closely, you can still see it. Dr. Mae Jemison, fantastic astronaut, uh, is also a dancer and has a wonderful TED Talk where she talks about how arts and dance inspired her career. Uh, one of the first young men that I mentored, uh, Dr. Ashe Goon Henry, I'm so proud of him, he's a professor now at, at Georgia Tech University, working on nanomaterials and making significant headway, and he's also an incredible African drummer. Faculty at Virginia State University where I am, when I, I know that's right, <laughs> apparently, Apparently, there are some Trojans in the house. Yeah. Okay, just checking. <laughs> but faculty at Virginia State University, when I meet with the science faculty, I find out that my biology and chemistry faculty are musicians, are artists. One is a DJ. And it starts to say that there's much more here than sometimes we give credit for. There is an artificial line between STEM and the arts, and that line is dangerous. It is absolutely dangerous. The idea that we try to separate things into a left brain and a right brain means that we cease to see the diversity in each other. We talk a lot about diversity outside, external diversity. We talk a lot about racial, sexual, sexual orientation, the diversity of our world, and many times we choose not to acknowledge the diversity in ourselves. And it means then that we don't ask the right questions to be able to move forward. There's an artificial line between STEM and the arts, and we gotta break it down. We've gotta break it down. My daughter, beautiful young lady, she came to me a couple of years ago. She's, what, 16 now, since so she was 14. And she said, Baba, now by the way, when she says Baba, it's an African word for father, which is what she called me when she was a baby. So whenever she says Baba, I know she wants something. <laughs> and she's coming for me. So she says, Baba, I said, yes, and she said, would you mind moving your car out of the garage permanently so that I can create an art studio? This is a young lady who is taking advanced calculus and advanced physics. Why? Because I want her to be in the family business. I want her to be a STEM educator. And my first answer was yes. And when my son said that he wanted a camera because he wanted to take pictures, I said yes. Because I know that in order for them to be the next generation of innovators, the real next generation of innovators, They've got to have both. They've got to have STEM. They've got to have the tools, and they've got to have the creative side. There's an artificial line between STEM and the arts, but you are going to make it go away. Thank you very much.